The next item of business is a debate on motion 6459 in the name of Shona Robison on the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill at Stage 1. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Shona Robison to speak to and move the motion up to nine minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill reforms the process that has been in place for the last 18 years for trans men and women to obtain a Gender Recognition Certificate, or GRC. We know from extensive consultation as well as from evidence heard by the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee that many trans people find the current system over-medicalised, complex, intrusive and invasive. These barriers are currently preventing many trans people from applying for a GRC. This bill will make it the, the process simpler, more streamlined and more respectful of the privacy and dignity of trans men and women. I am grateful to the committee for their majority support for the general principles of the bill and thank them for their extensive work scrutinising the bill. I also want to thank the many organisations and individuals who have participated in providing evidence since the bill was introduced. I acknowledge that people across this chamber and in the wider public have differing and genuinely held opinions on the matter of gender recognition reform. When I introduced this bill, I committed to listening to the views of everyone in a respectful manner. I have done that and continue to do that, and I'm confident that this afternoon's debate will be open, considered and respectful, consistent with the approach taken by the committee. And as a parliament, I think we have a responsibility to protect and support minority groups. One way we can do this is by leading by example with the tone of our discussions and the committee and this chamber to date has always ensured the tone is respectful. However, we know that it's not always the case outside of this parliament and particularly on social media. Abuse directed at anyone, whatever their opinion on this matter, is wrong. It's important to recognise that discrimination, harassment and abuse faced by trans people in Scotland simply for living their lives is, is, is wrong too. Statistics from Police Scotland show increases in hate crimes against people for being uh, transgender uh, have um, increased. Evidence suggests that the tone of discourse surrounding legal gender recognition has contributed to this. No matter what your point of view, we can all call this out where we see it and remain respectful to each other's opinions. Yes. Murdo Fraser. Thank you for giving way, and I endorse everything she's just said about the tone of this debate. But can I ask her, because there is real concern out there about the impact of what is being proposed, is it the Scottish Government's position that the issue of a gender recognition certificate changes someone's sex in relation to the Equality Act 2010? Because if so, that will open to biological males a whole range of spaces and services currently reserved to women and girls, uh, and that change will, will be made without the need for any medical intervention. Cabinet Secretary. So there is no change to the protections under the Equality Act uh, 2010, and I'm going to come on to the issue uh, of the impact on women and girls that some people are concerned about. I know that uh, where people have concerns about these reforms, and they generally centre on the potential impact on women and girls, their ability to safely and confidently access single-sex services and space, spaces be accommodated safely in prisons and participate fairly in sport. And I am sympathetic to these concerns because I know from my own experience and from years of working to improve women's rights that women and girls still face inequality and an increased risk of harm in Scotland today. This Government continues our work to address this, including through the Equally Safe Strategy and work to address misogynistic behaviour, because we know from all of the evidence that the threat to women comes from predatory and abusive men, not trans women or trans men. And helping one group to... Um, briefly, yes. Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way, and she will recognise my passion to make sure that everybody has access to sport equally. But would she recognise that when male and female go through puberty, there are significant uh, changes happen? The Q angle of the hip, the ability to apply that force, a third more muscle mass, a third more bone density, increased heart and lung capacity, menstruation, and the fact that uh, a similar sized man can, to a woman can apply 160 per cent of the force of a woman. Does she, does she recognise that danger that, that poses to women 
in sport where power and speed are important. And will she agree with me that a category, an open category alongside male and female would allow fair and equal participation for all? Can, can I be clear this bill changes none of that? It is for the sports governing bodies uh, to establish what is right for their sport and the member will be aware of sports governing bodies doing that. So it is for the sports governing bodies to do that. Um, just going back to you know, helping one group to better access their rights does not mean diluting or diminishing the rights of another group. Uh, we have set out why the bill will not change the provision of single-sex services, prisons or sport, because none of these are dependent on a possession of a GRC. And this view is supported by the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Amnesty International and other human rights organisations. I am glad that the majority of the committee have also concluded that there is no evidence to suggest that the rights of women and girls are impacted negatively by the bill. Presiding officer, we all want to live in a society that includes and supports everyone to live in a way that is true to themselves and that allows them to be accepted for who they are. Improving trans people's access to their existing legal rights is an important part of making that a practical reality. The Scottish Government has consulted widely on this issue in two of the largest public consultation exercises we have ever undertaken, and I am grateful to the Committee for continuing in that vein. A huge body of evidence has been gathered throughout the passage of the Bill so far, and a significant amount of work has gone into the production of the Stage 1 report. I am pleased that following their extensive evidence sessions, the majority of the Committee support the general principles of the Bill. I recognise that there is a minority view expressed. However, it is also clear that there is strong cross-party agreement that reform is needed. It is encouraging that while the Committee has requested more information and explanation in some areas, there are no specific recommended changes to the provisions of the Bill as introduced. I also welcome the majority view of the Committee that the age of eligibility for applicants should be 16. The Committee heard that young trans people currently feel excluded from the system, particularly at an age where they want consistent documentation before entering higher or further education or starting their first job. And I agree that it will be important to ensure appropriate support and signposting to resources for all applicants, and in particular for those aged 16 and 17. In line with the recommendation made by the Children and Young People's Commissioner, young people will be involved in development of the process and guidance. Uh, yes. Christine Graham. Now, Cabinet Secretary, you know I support this bill in principle, but I have got some concerns about the age range 16 to 18, notwithstanding the guidance which I know has been discussed, and also in that age range about the uh, living in that gender for just three months. Um, accordingly, I'm, I'm on the cusp of considering amendments, but I'd rather discuss this with the Cabinet Secretary first. So will she meet with me to discuss these particular issues? Though I give her assurance, I am supporting it at stage one, but I just want to put that marker down. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I'm happy to give that, that commitment, Presiding Officer. Uh, the majority of the committee support a reduction in the period of time applicants must have lived in the acquired gender. In my view, three months living in the acquired gender followed by a three-month reflection period represents a balanced and proportionate reduction in the overall length of the process, while ensuring applicants have a further opportunity to consider their decision before proceeding. I have, however, taken into account evidence given to the committee that the reflection period could be a disproportionate barrier where an applicant is terminally ill. An appreciate an important benefit of a GRC is ensuring that your death registration reflects the gender in which you lived. I therefore intend to introduce an, introduce an amendment to the Bill for a dispensation for the three-month uh, reflection period where an applicant is terminally ill. The Committee um, um, is short of time, but I will address things in my closing if you want to put them on the record later. The Committee sought further clarity on the meaning of ordinarily resident in the Bill, which we have provided in our response. Ordinarily resident is an established concept in several areas of law, including pensions and benefits, taxation and jurisdiction, including at least 17 acts of this parliament. In general, it means that someone's residence here is voluntary, for settled purposes and lawful. The committee noted the concerns raised by several uh, witnesses for the provision that allowing a person who has an interest in a GRC to apply to the sheriff to revoke a certificate that might allow legitimate applications to be frustrated. And while I understand these concerns, under the Bill, a person seeking to revoke a certificate has to have a genuine interest in the GRC. 
It would have to affect them materially and personally or professionally, and they would have to prove the ground on which the certificate could be revoked. References to a person who has an interest are also common in acts of this Parliament. The committee rightly highlights the importance of trans people that a GRC issued in Scotland should be recognised in the rest of the UK. Trans people will continue to be protected from the gender reassignment discrimination under the Equality Act 2010 throughout the UK, whether or not they have a GRC. It will be for other jurisdictions to set their policy on whether they recognise legal gender recognition obtained elsewhere. Under the current system, some who have obtained legal gender recognition out with the UK, including under systems based on self-determination similar to this bill, can apply in the UK without needing to provide any medical evidence. It is, of course, not uncommon for Scottish legislation to have implications for the rest of the UK. A Section 104 order under the Scotland Act 1998 provides a mechanism for the UK and Scottish governments to work together to make consequential modifications. The Scottish, UK and Northern Irish governments are working together at official level and have written to the UK Minister for Equalities reaffirming our commitment to work constructively together on this matter. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, there is majority support from the committee for the bill as introduced. Four of the five parties in the Chamber advocated for gender recognition reform in their manifestos. The Scottish Government has responded to the committee's request for further clarity in the written response. The bill has been subject to extensive scrutiny, both by the public through consultation and by a range of experts and stakeholders during the committee's evidence sessions. It is clear from the Stage 1 report that the committee's majority view is that the proposed reforms will support trans men and women to obtain legal gender recognition in a manner which is significantly less demeaning than the current medicalised system. Presiding officer, I look forward to hearing the views of MSPs and I welcome the opportunity to engage with them again on this bill and once again thank the committee for their work during stage one and to come. Thank you. Thank you. I will just take um, this opportunity to advise members that there is some time in hand for interventions. And I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to speak on behalf of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak in this debate as convener of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. I'd like to thank everyone who provided evidence to our committee. All of us, all of the evidence, both written and oral, informed our consideration of the bill. I also want to put on record our thanks to the committee clerks, and SPICE researchers and everyone else who supported our work thus far on the bill. Senator Officer, I should preface my remarks by highlighting that while the committee did reach agreement on many issues, we were not unanimous on all issues, and these divergences are reflected in our report. My speaking time this afternoon is limited, so my re remarks as convener will focus on the majority view of the committee on key aspects of the bill. I am sure that those members who represent the minority view will take the time to set out their thoughts later in their contributions. Presiding officer, by a majority of five to two, the committee supported the general principles of the bill. I, I thank the member, but unfortunately there is so much work in the committee's report that I am going to make sure that I am taking the time to go through that work. So unfortunately I won't be able to take interventions. The committee supports the removal of the gender recognition panel and its replacement with a model based on self-declaration. This will introduce a more humane and less intrusive process, bringing Scotland in line with international best practice and human rights standards. The committee also supports the removal of the requirement for a diagnosis of gender dysphoria and medical evidence. We heard evidence that medical gatekeeping is neither necessary nor appropriate. The legal status of a statutory declaration, the gravity with which such declarations are made and the fact that making a false declaration is an offence together create a robust process for accessing a GRC in line with international human rights best practice. The committee supports the proposed reduction from two so, as, as I've said to the member, I'm speaking, I'm speaking as the convener of the committee, and I, I'm trying to get through a really in-depth yes, report that, that the committee speaking. covered a lot of issues, a lot of ground. If there's time at the end, then perhaps there'll be time. But but right, but just to recall, I'm speaking as the convener of the committee, On of the and, and it's, it's really important that we cover the in, 
the huge amount of work that the committee did. And if, if anyone wants to, to, to take the time, then please um, take the time to look at that report. Point of order, Stephen oh. Kerr. Um, presiding officer, it is very important that members have the opportunity to intervene on the convener of this committee. Uh, there, there, are, there are matters of concern that should be raised in a calm and sensible way to reflect the concerns that have been made to us as members of the Scottish Parliament in respect to the work of the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr Kerr, for that point of order. Um, as members will be aware, it is entirely a matter for the members speaking as to whether or not they accept an intervention. Um, Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. C to carry on, the committee um, supports the proposed reduction from two years to three months um, of the period that an applicant must have lived in their acquired gender before applying for a GRC. We did, however, query the reasoning behind the specific choice of three months, and I note the response from the Cabinet Secretary stating that this represents the Government's view of a balanced and proportionate way of improving the current system. We also asked the Scottish Government to consider whether the three-month reflection period is appropriate, and I welcome the Scottish Government's response, in particular its proposed amendment in relation to those who are terminally ill. The Committee also supports lowering the age of eligibility from 18 to 16. This accords with existing rights in terms of the Age of Legal Capacity Scotland Act 1991. We heard that most young people reach decisions about their gender identity long before they consider applying for a GRC. And I welcome the Government's commitment to work with the Children and Young People's Commissioner and Young People's Organisations to ensure guidance is in place on the effects of obtaining a GRC as well as signposting to specialist support. On the requirement that applicants must be ordinarily resident in Scotland, the committee sought clarity on several eligibility issues, and I note the response from the Scottish <coughs> Government highlighting challenges around devolved competency and confirming that the Cabinet Secretary has raised these issues with the UK Government. On the issue of GRCs um, in, issued in Scotland being recognised um, in the rest of the UK, which we heard was important to trans people. I note um, the information set out in the Scottish Government's response to the committee, confirming that applicants from over 40 countries can apply via a streamlined UK route, including countries which have introduced similar reforms to those proposed in Scotland, such as Belgium, Denmark, Norway and Iceland. On the Bill's provisions that a person of interest may apply to revoke a GRC on various grounds, a report calls for any vexatious complaints to be dealt with robustly. And the Scottish Government has helpfully provided additional information, including setting out the wider legislative uh, context in terms of the drafting of this provision and provided examples of persons who might be considered to have an interest. A report noted concerns around avoiding criminalising anyone who enters into um, an application process for a GRC in good faith and then changes their mind. And the committee has since received assurances from the Scottish Government around the process for withdrawal of an application and also the process through which a person who has obtained legal gender recognition can legally change their gender again or detransition. Concerns were raised uh, with the committee about perceived impacts of the bill on women and girls and minority ethnic groups and uh, religious belief. And while recognising that such views are sincerely held, the committee believes that the concerns raised go beyond the scope of this bill and we are satisfied that the bill itself will not change any of the protections or definitions set out in the Equality Act 2010. Our con on concerns of whether the bill may impact upon decisions relating to whether um, to house transgender people in Scotland's prisons, the committee believes that this is out with the scope of the bill. Notwithstanding this, we were satisfied that the process of possession of a GRC does not affect the Scottish Prison Service's risk assessment process, whereby an individual is placed in the most appropriate estate, whether for their own safety or the safety of others, regardless of whether or not they have a GRC. Trans people's participation in sport was also raised in evidence, which the committee notes is an issue that is much wider and largely unconnected with the provisions in this bill. The committee agrees with the view of Sports Scotland that GRCs have no impact on participation in sport in accordance with the exemptions provided in section 195 of the Equality Act 2010. While noting the complexities outlined by the, by the Scottish Government on the extension of the bill to non-binary people, the committee was disappointed that this issue cannot be dealt with in this bill. 
We heard in evidence from young trans and non-binary people that this is an issue that is particularly important to them. And I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to develop an action plan by spring 2023 based on the outcomes from the Working Group on Non-Binary Equality, setting out how it intends to improve equality and bring about real positive and lasting changes to the lives of non-binary people. In closing, Presiding Officer, on behalf of the Committee, yeah. I would like to thank everyone who engaged in our Stage 1 scrutiny of the Bill. I want to particularly thank the trans people and parents who shared their experiences with the current system. It was really helpful for us to hear their personal stories, and I recognise that doing so took courage. I'd also again like to thank everyone who supported our work thus far, particularly the Committee clerks and SPICE researchers. Presiding Officer, by a majority of five to two, the committee recommends that the general principles of this bill be approved. Well done, Jay. I now call on Rachel Hamilton. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And uh, considering that uh, some of the members will not take interventions, I'd like to ask them a couple of questions. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to know from the Cabinet Secretary in her closing whether she actually believes uh, GRC changes your sex for the purposes of the Equality Act, which she didn't um, actually answer that to um, my colleague Murdo Fraser. Um, and there were other interventions that I hopefully will get into members later, but it's, it's already you know, eating into my speech because I, I just think that this needs to be a really open debate mm -hmm. and we need to get this crucial legislation absolutely right. The current system for obtaining a GRC has, of course, been distressing for many, and I hope that we will all agree today that we can improve the rights for trans people. But we also need to protect vulnerable young girls and the hard-won rights of women and girls. And it is in this spirit that I want to outline the deeply held concerns of my own, my colleagues on these Scottish Conservative benches, and according to recent polling, a clear majority of the Scottish public to oppose the removal of key safeguards. Sadly, so far, these legitimate concerns, I believe, have been ignored by this government. And even our voices, I believe, are being ignored today. The Cabinet Secretary was generous with her interventions, but I do believe the convener should have at that point taken some interventions. And as we move through the debate, I think that we should be honest and transparent. The bill received one of the highest volumes uh, well, I haven't even got into the sub, um, substance of my speech, but I will if there's something specific that you'd like to ask me about. This, the bill received one of the highest volumes of written evidence in the history of the Scottish Parliament. We've heard 11,000 submissions, presiding officer, and much of those contri contributions were overlooked, unfortunately, in the report. Um, but I would like to take the opportunity to everyone who did contribute to those um, submissions. And, and unfortunately, I regret to say that the timetable the committee had to set um, to consider evidence meant that only a small proportion of cont contributions had to, uh, could only be considered. It's important that those voices who have been ignored in this debate can be heard and the legitimate concerns about this bill can be discussed. Presiding officer, a GRC is not just a piece of paper. Mr Justice Schofield of the High Court in Northern Ireland described it as a conferring a significant and formal change in a person's status with potentially far-reaching consequences for them and for others, including the state. And the implications of this bill go beyond simply helping trans individuals gain recognition of their required gender. One of the overlooked implications were the significance of the bill's effect on the Equality Act. The Scottish Government and several members of the committee claim that the Equality Act does not fall within the scope of this bill. Yet in less than two weeks' time, the Scottish Government lawyers will be in court arguing that a GRC would change an individual's sex under the Equality Act for the purposes of the Gender Representation Act on public boards. The ERC have also shared concerns about the consequences of the bill on the Equality Act, noting that the extending the ability to change sex under the Act from a small defined group who have demonstrated their commitment and ability to live in acquired gender to a wider group who identify as the opposite gender at a given point and that will have clear implications for the operation of the Act. And the bill drafted is inextricably linked to the Equality Act, as I am trying to explain. So, just in a second. So let's just drop the pretense, have a grown-up conversation about what it means to issue more GRCs to a wider group and the obvious implications for women's sex-based rights. Yes, I will. 
Ruth McGuire. Thank you. I appreciate Rachel Hamilton giving way. I wonder if the committee received a definition of what it means to live in an acquired gender. Rachel Hamilton. Well, that is a, a great um, question because the definition was already in the uh, GRA 2004, um, and this is just rolling it over into this legislation as the SNP would like to see it reformed. And I hope that answers your question. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not as such. Um, but there were also lots of debate around the acquired gender of what it meant. Does it mean that you're, you're dressing in a certain way, acting in a certain way, speaking in a certain way? So there is a lot more discussion around this um, that could be had and debated. When organisations like MBM and For Women Scotland talk about protecting single-sex spaces and the rights of women in Scotland, they do so because they know that this bill and its consequences, as outlined by the EHRC, erodes the legal protection of single-sex spaces. We cannot allow these arguments to be ignored until this legislation has undermined measures that protect women's dignity, privacy and safety and promotes their equality. Presiding officer, a bad faith actor would currently find it very difficult to obtain a GRC, but with the proposed reforms, a non-falsifiable declaration is all that would stand between them and receiving a GRC, which means they could uh, insist on using or getting access to female-owned changing rooms, rape shelters, healthcare services and women's prisons. We are being asked to vote on all or nothing choice between the system of safeguards currently in place and self-declaration, on a false dichotomy of elaborate oversight or no oversight. Legislators in 2004 did not decide upon the safeguards in place today by accident. I appreciate that some of the hurdles trans people must overcome to obtain a GRA are tied up in these safeguards, but there is room to make the process easier without tearing it to pieces. And there is certainly room to work on reducing the time trans people have to wait throughout this process and for medical support from our NHS. It is a task our legislators here, and it's a hard one, to ensure that safeguards exist so that this system is not taken advantage of. And I hope that members today can join with me and, and, and achieve that aim, rather than just accept that we can reform this legislation without doing so. Concerns were also raised and ignored about lowering the age at which somebody can obtain a GRC to 16. Indeed, some of the evidence used to support these concerns came from the interim CAS review, which was similarly brushed aside by the majority of the committee. Mm -hmm. This landmark review notes that... Yes? Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for taking the intervention. I don't think it's fair to say that the CAS review was brushed aside. I, I specifically, and others, highlighted that there were areas that the CAS review was looking into that the organisations in Scotland could learn from. It wasn't that we said it should be brushed aside. I don't think that represents the committee's conversation. Thank Pam Dun Dun Duncan Glancy uh, for her intervention. Um, perhaps it's just being a bit brutal on the views of the committee. However, two of us, my colleague Pam Gosell and I, think that this leg legislation should be paused until the CAS review is published in full because... This landmark review notes that a young person's gender identity may remain in flux until their mid-twenties. This point was backed up by written and oral evidence in the committee. Without addressing that evidence um, uh, and dismissed out of hand, the Cabinet Secretary failing to acknowledge any opposition to her view on that point. This part of the bill has left so many unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. The opportunity represented by the review, the CAS review, to gain clarity um, has been spurned, I believe. It was deeply irresponsible of the committee members who chose to do so. And as Dr Cass made clear, social transition is not a neutral undertaking. Is Parliament really going to pretend that changing a teenager's legal status from one sex to another is. There is so much more to cover in this debate, but with my remaining time, I just want to hi highlight some other unanswered questions. The committee inquiry exposes many of these and answers few. I've talked about the effect of the Bill on the Equality Act. Perhaps the courts will give us some clarity next month, but I haven't even begun to discuss the cross-border anomalies highlighted by the EHRC, the extension of the overseas recognition associated with the Bill 
or the impact on marriage and civil partnerships. Presiding officer, with regret, I believe this is a mess. The unintended consequences of this legislation for women and girls, vulnerable young people and the trans people is trying to help but is deeply alarming and the divisive nature of the issue has been handled poorly. I know you're looking at me to uh, close, presiding officer. I have so much to say, but it is crucial, absolutely crucial, that we get this legislation right. But the SNP government need to start listening to the legitimate concerns of women and the Scottish public. So far, there is little evidence that they have done so. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Trans rights are human rights. They are inalienable, indivisible, and interdependent. Human rights are our rights not because we are women or trans or gay or disabled or black, but because we are human and society and parliament have a legal obligation to uphold them. For trans people, being recognised in law for who you are is fundamental to this. In committee and throughout my equality and human rights campaigning life, I have heard, and I am in no doubt, that the process to do this is dehumanising, intrusive, offensive, expensive and lengthy and needs to change. I and Scottish Labour will therefore be voting for this bill at stage one today. We have always been at the forefront of equality and human rights, and we always will defend and protect them. Taking unnecessary and unhelpful medical requirements out of the process and replacing it with something that is dignified, more accessible, administrative in nature, and delivers a process in which both trans people and the wider public can have confidence is not just long overdue or compliant with international best practice, it is essential for a society that believes in equality and human rights, and it is the right thing to do. As the bill proceeds, yes. Sue Webber. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Does the member believe and agree with her party's former leader, Joanne Lamont, who said that MSPs must consider any unintended consequences of gender reform on women and girls? Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for that intervention. And we do believe that the consequences of the legislation and the data collected as a result of it needs to be strengthened so that we can properly evaluate the legislation when it comes in to pass. And that is why we think that, that there are amendments that need to be brought on data collection and on scrutiny and post-legislative um, evaluation. As the bill proceeds, Scottish Labour will seek to ensure the new arrangements for the application and administration of GRCs does this. We believe that to ensure this, there are a number of areas where the legislation can be improved, including on the process the Registrar General will put in place to apply for a GRC, the provisions around age, on signposting to support and information on the data collected about GRCs, and that addresses hopefully the member's point, and as is the duty upon all of us as legislators, we stand ready to scrutinise the bill to ensure that it does all of this. But before I turn to the detail, I want to say a word about the conversation so far. It is my view that delays to the legislation have allowed a vacuum to develop and people to interpret the bill as something it is not, to reach wrong or unproven conclusions about what its impacts may be. This has made conversations around it very difficult and at times hurtful and damaging. I also know there are people, including some women, who have concerns about the impact of the bill and specifically on the protection of single-sex services. As a disabled woman, I know that all rights are hard fought and hard won. And so I understand the strength of feeling and I understand why people need strong assurance that their rights will be protected. It is essential that everyone's rights are protected. In all the evidence I've heard, and it's a lot, it is clear to me that women's and trans rights can, must and do already exist without one causing detriment to the other, mostly because people respect one another but also because the protections in the Equality Act make that so. Labour introduced that Act, and it rightly protects both women and trans people from discrimination. That's why we support both reform of the Gender Recognition Act and the continued implementation of protections and provisions within the 2010 Act. As the bill progresses, Scottish Labour believe it should be clear in the legislation that nothing in it affects the protections in the Equality Act. We will bring an amendment at stage two to do that, and following the positive conversations that I've had with the Cabinet Secretary, I'd be grateful if she would indicate the Government's support for this in closing. If 
presiding officer, is there time back if I take an intervention? There is a little time. Thank you. I'll take an intervention. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you very much, Pam Duncan Glancy. Um, does she believe that a GRC changes sex for the purposes of the Equality Act? Yes or no? Pam Duncan Glancy. I believe that a GRC changes your sex for all legal purposes, including the Equality Act, but I also believe that the Equality Act is a piece of legislation that gets the interaction between sex and gender perfectly correct. It is an act that conflicts to context and situations, and it is the act that is in place to protect all people's rights, and they can exist at all alongside one another. I and my party are, I and my party are committed to reform. But we all need organisations to be empowered to do the right thing and everyone to be able to enjoy their rights equally and in peace. That needs leadership and clarity. This would help bring that, and I ask the Government to work with us on it, and indeed on the other areas of the Bill that we believe must be strengthened. As it stands, the Bill sets out who can apply for a GRC, but not how. There is little detail on what the application to the Registrar General will look like, the information the Registrar General will require, nor what information they will give applicants who apply. The use of the term acquired gender in Section 4 is unclear and does not recognise that steps prior to seeking legal recognition will have been long and well thought out. The same is true of the reflection period introduced by Section 3, and I know that many trans people find this deeply offensive. Beyond the terminology, this area of the process and the length of these periods are considered by many to be arbitrary. Clarity on the rationale for that from the Government would be welcome. We note that the Government have said that the National Record of Scotland should draft guidance on the process, but we would like to see more detail. We believe that, would be, that will be crucial. We would also like clarity around the regulatory powers introduced by Section 11 that allow the Registrar General to request additional evidence. Specifically on that point, we seek reassurance that medicalisation cannot be reintroduced to the process. We also have concerns about the limitations of the term ordinarily resident in Section 2, which could exclude refugees and asylum seekers from the process. I do not believe this would be fair, and we note the comments on this in the Government's response to the committee report, and we would like the opportunity to discuss this and consider it further. Too often trans people wait years for services or support. Information they need is rarely available, and they can be left isolated. Whilst we note the Government has referred to guidance in its response to the committee report, we believe it, that it should take the opportunity in this legislation to include in the Bill clear obligations for signposting to support and information for all applicants. Lastly, there are also concerns around the low-level data collection, as I have touched on, in Section 15. Knowing the impacts of this Bill, positive, negative and neutral, is essential. As it stands, the data collection and reporting mechanisms outlined are not comprehensive enough to allow for proper evaluation of the impacts of this legislation and should be strengthened. Presiding officer, in closing, trans people have already been waiting for far too long for these changes. They deserve nothing less than good legislation that allows them to be recognised for who they are and in which everyone can have confidence. Scottish Labour are determined to ensure we get that, to scrutinise this legislation and ensure it meets its objectives and delivers the change trans people need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Alex Cole Hamilton. Um, thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. It really gives me great pleasure to rise from my party in support of this important bill. I am glad we are finally here. It has been a long and painful road, not least for those who are right now being harmed by the Gender Recognition Act as it stands. And I want to offer my thanks to those government ministers, Shona Robertson, and before her, Shirley Ann Somerville, and indeed the First Minister, for getting us to this point. It has been a long time coming. Support for these reforms was, first in was included in four party manifestos in the 2021 election, and all our respective manifestos at the election before that. The passage of time since then has allowed these reforms to become the subject of myth and hyperbole in our communities. That is deeply regrettable. It is now incumbent upon all of us to debate these issues with compassion and with, sens with sensitivity, and to remember what is being pro proposed in this bill is simply a technical amendment to law. It is always right and vitally important to hear the widest possible range of views when it comes to changing legislation. As a Liberal, I believe in the right of everyone to speak their mind, to express their opinions. You shouldn't censor people, but instead you should seek to meet their arguments or concerns with reason and with evidence. But let me be clear from the outset, we cannot allow this debate to be hijacked by those who would question the very existence of the trans community 
or who fear and vilify them and would seek to prevent their access to equal rights. To come on to the bill itself, Liberal Democrats passionately believe in the rights of everyone to express the fullness of who they are, freely and unencumbered by unnecessary scrutiny, interference or abuse. It is not right that trans people are forced to seek permission to be who they are, but the original legislation currently asks that of them. Given the many challenges they face in almost every aspect of their lives, we should seek to make their rec the recognition of the, their identity on the documents that they are required to hold the very least of their concerns. We certainly have the power to do that. We cannot allow the original act to stand unamended. We have all heard the many troubling accounts of the damage caused by the current process, the unnecessary anxiety and pain that that process exacts on those who go through it. And that's why Liberal Democrats have long been persuaded of the case for reform. So let's unpack the reform that we are talking about and what it will mean. The current process to obtain a gender recognition certificate is de dehumanising and both financially and emotionally costly for trans people. It involves submitting evidence of having lived continuously in their proposed gender for a minimum of two years and then having to wait anxiously while their identity is debated by five strangers who they will never meet. If the decision goes against them, they have no right of appeal. This legislation is solely about making that process quicker and more humane. It's about respecting the humanity of trans people. Presiding officer, I would like to address the subject of women's safety as it pertains to this bill. It is absolutely vital to state, for the avoidance of all doubt, that no part of this legislation will make it easier for a man to access a woman's space. A gender recognition certificate allows for a trans person's birth certificate to be changed. I can think of no venue or establishment which requires the presentation of a GRC or a birth certificate to validate entry. Indeed, presiding officer, neither certificate can be used to prove identification and no permit or ID is currently required of anyone to enter any sort of gender specific space. This legislation changed nothing in that regard. I will. Brian Whittle. I really appreciate the member giving way, and I can't disagree with anything the member says. And I'd like to put it on record that me and all of my party are looking for equality here. But, but to the, the question I put to the Cabinet Secretary earlier on, it really worries me uh, now because it's, sport is already struggling to deal with transgender women at the moment, and they're all over the place in this. And my point is that we need to make sure we, we create legislation that protects everybody, and it's really important in the face of the bill that we protect women's sport in this, because if we look at Caitlin Jenner, the, um, who, the very celebrated trans woman who's brought trans women's rights to the fore, he was Bruce Jenner in 1976 when he won the, World, uh, won the Olympic Championship. We cannot, in his, his view, you cannot allow transgender women to compete in women's sport. Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, Presiding officer, may I have the time back? Oh, yes, as much as I can. I'm, I'm grateful for the intervention. Um, th this is a matter for governing bodies in sport. This is not a matter for this piece of legislation. And, and I think that, frankly, that is, that is a distraction from what we're trying to do, which is actually to make the lives and the lived experience of the people in our community who are trans easier. My party is satisfied that the proposals in the bill, which will create that new criminal offence uh, for the making of a false declaration, provide a deterrent to anyone seeking to abuse the system. This is a safeguard that has worked well in those countries that have gone before us. The spaces that are cited by those who oppose reform are protected by many safeguards, personal judgment and assessment. There is no challenge to any of those protections in the pages of this bill. Presiding officer, I am fully aware of the fact that as a man, I do not live with the inherent fear and anxiety that many women so often feel with regard to their personal safety in our society. A huge amount still needs to be done so that women feel safe in public. But while that discussion is one we need to address in the round and with urgency, this is not the forum for that vital debate. It deserves its own act of parliament. It's important to note that the stage one report of the committee that scrutinized this bill, and I commend their work for it, said, and I quote, when asked about evidence of abuse and concerns, no witness was able to provide concrete examples. Let's be clear, any threat to women 
does not come from trans people, but as the Cabinet Secretary said herself, but from predatory and abusive men, men who do not need a licence or any form of certification to abuse women. Trans women also fall victim to those same offenders, and they are twice as likely to be a victim of violent crime than the average person. Presiding officer, in closing, at its core, this legislation is about human rights. It's about respecting the dignity and the autonomy of transgender people who've been waiting far too long for these reforms, which is why I and my party are so proud to support it today. Thank you. We move to the open debate, and I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Jamie Green. Yeah, thank you, President Officer, and it really is a, a great privilege to speak in this debate today. As a member of the committee scrutinising this legislation, I can assure the Chamber that this process was robust. As the convener has said, we heard from a whole range of people and organisations with varying views on the bill. And I'd like to thank everybody who gave us evidence, because despite what we might sometimes see in social media, I'm sure all the committee members will agree that it was done in a very, very respectful manner. And of course, like the convener has done, I think it's important that we pay tribute to the clerks for their amazing and tireless work on this bill. They really have been exceptional. Presiding officer, this thorough committee process also complements the fact that the Scottish Government ran two consultations on this, as the Cabinet Secretary has herself already outlined. But why do we need this bill? Well, we all know that trans men and women are among the most stigmatised people in our country, and many find the current system for obtaining a GRC to be intrusive and demeaning. And there's certainly no doubt that we heard that directly from those people on committee. Actually, some very harrowing evidence at times. This bill does not give trans people any new rights, nor does it change the 2010 Equality Act. It simply makes the process of obtaining a GRC much simpler, less degrading, degrading and more humane for trans people. This is an already often stigmatised group that already have poorer health outcomes than the general population, and hate crimes against trans people are increasing year on year. This already marginalised group need their parliament to stand up for them, and we can do that by making this very small change that could impact greatly on their lives. It is perhaps then obvious why all parties in this chamber have had a commitment to change the GRA in their manifesto at some point, and many of us here stood on that in the last election. Because at the core, we all of us, every one of us in here, believe in human rights, and trans rights are human rights. Presiding officer, there has been a lot of talk about what the bill does and does not do, and despite the best intentions of individuals and organisations, misinformation can quickly circulate. The primary thing the bill does is remove the need for a gender recognition panel and a medical diagnosis. Yep. Yep. Ruth McGuire. I thank Fulton McGregor for taking an intervention. I wonder when the committee were doing their scrutiny if they found out under the current system that's, that's being done away with how many people are actually refused a GRC and what the reasons are for those refusals. Perhaps can, uh, thank, I thank the member for intervention. I'll perhaps um, come back to that a wee bit, but I would, I would uh, direct the member to the committee report, which is, which is very detailed. As I was saying, in evidence, we had some quite widespread support for the removal of a gender recognition panel and a medical diagnosis from the SHRC, Rape Crisis Scotland, the Church of Scotland, and many others. It is also very much in line with the WHO's redefinition of gender identity related health and in line with many other countries, including Ireland, Norway, and New Zealand. The bill also reduces the period someone has to live in the required gender from two years to three months. We did have some concerns over the phrase acquired gender, but ultimately, and this might answer uh, Ruth McGuire's earlier uh, intervention, we, did, we found it difficult to find an alternative phrase and accepted that it, that it had a legal basis. We also agreed by majority that the period should be reduced, but we weren't clear initially why three months was selected, and I do welcome the Government's response to us on this. Um, the bill also lowers the age of eligibility to apply for a GRC from 18 to 16. Uh, I have already taken one intervention. Apologies. I think it is fair to say that this was one of the most contested areas of the Bill, with strong arguments for both age ranges. And I was pleased actually, that the, the Cabinet Secretary reflected this in her evidence to us when talking about how the Government came to a decision. And as we have heard uh, also from Alex Cole Hamilton, the Bill also introduces a new criminal offence to make a false statutory declaration or false application with a punishment for up to two years and or a fine. And although we had some re reservations about that, I think that uh, we would also hope that this would be an additional safeguard moving forward. And, President officer, now turn to some of the concerns that were raised. These are strongly held, and I do not think they should be easily dismissed. I think it dilutes our own uh, process if we do that. 
In committee, we did not do that and asked the questions of witnesses that you would expect. And I hope that that committee process will help to build up consensus as we move forward. In relation to the rights of women and girls in single-sex spaces, we were convinced after a lot of questioning that this bill simply does not have the remit to affect these. No one in this place would want this to be the case, and I know this Government is fully committed to protecting women's rights. We heard from a lot of organisations who told us there would be no impact, including Engender, Amnesty and NUS Scotland. And here is a quote from the Children's Commissioner, which I think captures it. We should have a lot of discussion about strengthening protections against individuals who are at risk, rather than implying a whole category of people poses a risk and, rest and restricting their rights." End quote. Also, in respect of sport, Sport Scotland told us the sport bodies can already make restrictions, and this bill will have no impact on that, again reassuring and I direct Brian Whittle to uh, the report as well. Presiding of some relation to the impact in prisons, the SPS were very clear that there would be no impact and told us in our gender identity and gender reassignment policy we take an individualised approach. In other words, things are taken on a case-by-case -case basis. If the impact in prisons, however, is an area of concern going forward, then Lucy Hunter Blackburn gave us a possible amendment to think about when she told committee it is one of the easiest things to fix. The bill could be amended to say that a GRC is not effective in prison, alloca uh, prison allocation decisions. That would leave things back to where we want them to be, in the hands of the people who make those decisions. It is a relatively fixable part of the bill. And that brings me on to, to a final point. I am not going to have time. Apologies. If we vote for this at stage one today, then I know that committee, as well as government, will have an open door ahead of stage two, as we all want to build consensus and make law as good as it can be. Presiding officer, in conclusion, for any of my coll colleagues across the chamber thinking of not voting for this today, I would simply ask why. Yes, there is still a lot of work to be done, and hopefully by working together we can make improvements and build further confidence. But at its core, this bill is narrow and only really impacts one group of people, a group already marginalised, and that impact we heard would be positive. Other countries have done it without experiencing negative impacts some people are worried about, and so why shouldn't we? Scotland is not somehow inferior to these other nations. Trans people in Scotland, like everywhere else, deserve their parliament to stand up for them. And I am sure many will be watching today, hoping we can do just that. This bill will not impact a great number of people, but it will mean a great things for a few people. And I strongly encourage everyone to vote for it at stage one and let all voices come together and move forward as one. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Karen Adam. Thank you. Sometimes politics is about following your heart. Today I am going to speak from mine too. I want to share with you the things that I know and the things that I don't know. Here's what I do know. I know what it feels to grow up feeling different. I know what it feels not to understand why you feel different or who to turn to for help or advice. I know what it feels like to be told that how you feel is just the phase or that it is somehow to be suppressed or even worse, that you are immoral or delusional or mentally ill, destined to a life of misery. I know what it feels like to be threatened, to be marginalised, to be bullied and to be discriminated against. So I did say directly to the trans people in the chamber today and those outside, I hear you and I want to make things better for you. That is my commitment to you today. But here's what I don't know. I don't know what it feels like to have fought for centuries for equality in a male misogynistic world. I don't know what it feels like to suffer violence at the hands of a man. I don't know what it feels like to be the victim of sexual violence or to seek solace in safe spaces. I don't know what it feels like to compete in professional sport and feel like I'm playing in an unfair field. I don't know what it feels like to have a young daughter and hold genuine concerns about her welfare in public spaces or single sex spaces. So I say to those of you who have written to me in great volume, I hear you too, because that really is the dilemma that we face today the undeniable need to improve the lives of trans people whilst protecting the rights of others. We also need to pass good law. That onus is on us to pass good law without unintended consequences, something we're actually not very good at in this place, if I'm quite honest with you. I do not envy the Scottish Government here, but also I do not have much sympathy for it, because they've managed to feel so much anger on the sides of those who both support and oppose the reform at the same time. Let me be clear, outcomes for trans people in Scotland are shockingly poor. 
shocking. Poor access to medical health, poor access to physical and mental health, high rates of suicide and self-harm, and a failure to tackle growing transphobia. This bill fixes none of that. Perhaps it should. The debate around this has been undoubtedly toxic over the years, and there is a spectrum of views. We know that those who believe that the government is not going far enough, for example, by the exclusion of non-binary people from it, and those who are vocalising valid concerns, uh, which have been largely ignored. But there are also those who are, I think, barely thinly hiding transphobia amongst some of those concerns, if we were honest. I actually think most people want to do the right thing for everyone in Scottish society. But equally, I cannot feel a help but feel an air of sadness in some of the arguments being used against reform to gender recognition, which are often, word for word, the same arguments that were used against the age of consent, against gay rights, against same-sex marriage, and against same-sex adoption. Words which decades, decades later, are now being used to justify academic arguments about, about why this bill is wrong and those who support it are also wrong. We have come such a long way in, in, in Scotland in our equality rights. I'm really proud of the progress we've made. This does feel to me a little bit like the last great hurdle. All of that being said, however, I need to be honest, I have some reservations about the bill as it is currently drafted. I have concerns about the interactions between this bill and other people's rights, freedoms and equalities. I do not think they have been fully considered or addressed by the government, as is evident by the debate today. The, this is evident by the schisms in view between the AHRC and the Scottish Government's interpretation of that guidance, who admit themselves we recognise the need for more guidance on the use, for example, of exceptions in same-sex spaces. Guidance isn't good enough for everyone. That is clear. The Bill must be clear about that, and it must be addressed as the Bill progresses through the Parliament. I also have more generally wider problems with inconsistencies in how the law treats those of ages 16 and 17. The law says they can vote, but they can't gamble. The law says they can serve in the army, but they can't drink alcohol to celebrate it. And now we've been asked that they should be able to self-identify gender and seek medical intervention, and the lifelong implications that that sometimes brings to people. I've had professionals email me and say, this is utter madness. You cannot let that happen. But equally, I've had many young trans people write to me, begging me, pleading me, please support this. We need this, and we have the right to do this. I will be honest with you, I don't know what the answer to that is because everyone is an individual. But what must happen is the government must be led by evidence. They must do the right thing for young people, which both protects them, and it must protect them, but also respect their soundness of mind. I also see why concerns have been raised about the three-month period of living in acquired gender, as it is. Or, as some have pointed out, what does that even mean? It does seem a big jump from two years to three months. I understand that. I understand that people have problems with that. But I also understand that people think this is a good move, which treats people with more dignity and respect. I ask, perhaps, is there a compromise to be had in that respect? And I also understand why some people put great faith in the solemnity and gravity of statutory declara declarations. They see it as a safeguard. But there are others who see it as little more than the piece of paper it is written on. Safeguards are absolutely vital in this conversation. But let me be clear, predatory trans people are not the problem. Predatory men are the real problem here. The law must be robust. The law must be robust in dealing with those who use the a process of changing their gender with mal intent. If this bill is not clear about that, it should be. We will help you fix that. These are all issues which are rightly being debated today. And I really want to thank my leadership and colleagues for allowing me to express my own personal views, even though they may differ uh, from theirs. I don't expect, didn't expect much applause today because that's not what I'm after. What I'm after today is to make good law, as we all should. I want to close, presiding officer, by sharing two very important beliefs that I hold that are very important to this debate. They're personal to me. The first is that I do not believe that being trans is a mental illness. No more than being gay is a mental illness. I support previous commitments publicly made by UK Conservative governments to remove this from the process. If it's good enough for Theresa May and Penny Mordaunt, then it's good enough for me. The second is that reform of this nature must be achieved in a way which betters the rights of everyone, not degrades them, a point eloquently made by Engender and their submission to us. I know there are strong views in this debate. But these are problems that the government must fix. It is their bill, after all. We will help them do that if they so need. Friends, I will support the passage of this bill at stage one today because I owe it to a community which has given so much to me over the years. And I urge colleagues to think very carefully about how they vote. Those of us being granted that personal freedom to 
make that choice ourselves and those who are being whipped into party position, a position I do not envy. I will warn and end in a warning. This cannot end up a dog's dinner of a bill which simply divides people and fuels the othering of anyone. I want it to instead bring us together under one common goal of making every single Scot feel safe, feel welcome and feel included. Every single one of us. I know that's easier said than done. I wish the government luck because listening to today's debate, they're going to need it. I call Karen Adam to be followed by Paul O'Kane. Thank you, President Officer. And to my colleague Jamie Green, um, you know, some of the things you said that you don't know, I do, and I'm honoured to have the privilege to talk from that point of view today. President Officer, this is a wonderful day. A day where I can stand here in this chamber and take part in shaping legislation which will improve the lives of citizens in Scotland who are some of the most marginalised, misunderstood and vilified people in our society. The progress Scotland was making to become a world leader in human rights has undoubtedly been hindered by a campaign of fear and misinformation against the trans population. Trans people continue to suffer poorer outcomes relative to the wider population and we have the opportunity to do something which takes a small step to improve those outcomes. The Scottish Government must and is working to promote the rights of everyone – disabled people, BAME people, LGBTQ plus people and women – to protect them from discrimination. And we as lawmakers and public figures have a duty to work to end the stigma and prejudice that is often experienced in this context particularly for trans people, so that they feel safe, secure and accepted in our society. My goodness, they need it. We all know our minds. Why are trans people any different in that? If we think they don't, then perhaps a deep reflection on that internal bias must surely be addressed and that discrimination confronted. They should be trusted to make decisions about their own bodies and it should be a fundamental given right to have bodily autonomy and to have the freedom to take space up in this world without being impeded by anyone else. The Gender Recognition Reform Bill does not even introduce any new rights for trans people, but what it does is reduce the trauma associated with the process of obtaining a Gender Recognition Certificate, simplifying the administrative process to gain legal recognition, which has been a right for 18 years. This is such a small change but a change to remove barriers, gatekeeping and that impeding that I spoke of. This bill would demedicalise the process, which is nothing new, moving to a system based on freedom, choice and respect. Personal declaration rather than medical diagnosis will bring Scotland into line with well-established systems in Norway, Denmark, Ireland and recent reforms in Switzerland and New Zealand. In 2018, Scotland was hailed as a world leader on human rights and on our inclusion for our LGBT plus citizens, for things such as inclusive education. But I believe if we don't pass this bill, we will be behind the times. Something crucial to this debate is adding the voices of trans people themselves, and I would urge everyone in this chamber to do so reach out to the Equality Network and the Scottish Trans Alliance, or like I did when I had questions about the community, I went directly to them. I asked if I could hear from them who had lived experience. I was able to connect with trans people and truly listen to them and their stories, unfortunately with some true harrowing accounts, which were only experienced because they were trans. And I want to sincerely thank them for putting themselves in the position of having to relive their trauma so they could help others. President Officer, just before we came into chambers, I had the opportunity to go out and talk to some trans people. And just as I was leaving, I, I was pulled aside and, and spoken to and I was thanked for, for listening. And when I was chatting to this person, um, just as I was leaving, they said, oh, by the way, my name is Ross. And I couldn't believe it. I said, my speech today has a quote by you in it. And just by that chance meeting, it really deepened my resolve in what I must do 
to work harder for our trans siblings. So I'm going to read out the quote from Russ. I would feel safer with a GRC, but the current process risks re-traumatising me because of harm already inflicted by psychiatrists. When I first told a psychiatrist I was trans as a teenager, they prescribed me electroconvulsive therapy. The harm this did meant I didn't feel safe to come out again and transition until I was in my 60s. For the sake of my mental health, I can never again allow some authority figure who doesn't know me to decide whether I am who I say I am. Ross. When we make law in this chamber, surely the best laws are made with the lived experiences and the people it affects being at the core of it. We know that laws made before women's voices were included not only discriminated against us, but they were detrimental to us. We are all human and deserve rights, which help us, not hinder us. Trans people are entitled to have human rights. They are as valid as you and me and everyone here. They're entitled to protection and validation and support in law. And given any opportunity to have that equal footing, we should all have that without discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. I call Paul Payne to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to contribute to this important uh, stage one debate of the bill. In rising to speak, I'm pleased to follow colleagues who have made contributions that are constructive and respectful in tone, particularly Karen Adam, Pam Duncan Glancing and Jamie Green. And I recognise all too well the truth that um, Jamie Green opened with. Um, Presiding Officer, I, I do want to focus my contribution on the bill before us. However, at the outset of my speech, I do want to make comment on the public discourse about the bill and around the bill. Over the last few years, the tone of the debate has reflected poorly on our nation. It has been divisive and toxic. In the vacuum created by the legislative process being delayed, interpretation of the bill has led to conversations that have been hurtful and damaging and largely related to what is not in the bill and what the bill does not do. I believe that there has been too much heat and not enough light. In his important and deeply considered book, Building a Bridge, the Jesuit priest Father James Martin considers how we must build bridges of respect, compassion and sensitivity between those who have come to fundamentally different viewpoints. He speaks in the context of a bridge between LGBT people and the Catholic Church, hence my interest in his work. But he speaks about fundamental truths that can be transposed. He speaks about the use of names, naming and respecting the fundamental dignity of every human person. He speaks about the way we describe a person, calling them what they ask to be called. He talks about respecting identity and humanity. He speaks about not applying generic pejorative terms to whole groups of people, no matter how much we fundamentally disagree. Because the rhetoric has, let's be honest, dangerously veered often into transphobia and homophobia too. Even in public life, such as the corridors of this place, or in our council chambers. That's always unacceptable and must be addressed. And I also recognise that there are people who have views that are sincerely held and should not be described in pejorative terms as part of one larger group. We all have a duty to conduct our discussion better, particularly in online spaces. Perhaps I am naive presiding officer, but I do continue to believe in building that bridge but it requires respect, compassion and sensitivity. I will turn to the Bill. In our 2021 manifesto, the Scottish Labour Party committed to reforming the Gender Recognition Act to demedicalise the process of applying for a Gender Recognition Certificate. This is a manifesto commitment that we were elected on and a pledge to trans people, who are one of the most marginalised groups in society, as we have heard from colleagues already today. And so in supporting reform of the Gender Recognition Act, I am proud to support party policy, but also the position of LGBT Labour, which has been in existence for over 40 years and affiliated to the Labour Party since 2002. I am also following in the footsteps of former Labour parliamentarians, such as Kezia Dugdale, a former Labour leader, and my predecessor in the West of Scotland, Mary Fee, who proudly championed the rights of trans people in this chamber and continues to advocate for reform of the Gender Recognition Act from outside of this Parliament. 
Of course, I understand and appreciate that some people have raised their concerns with aspects of the Bill in its current form. And that's why it's incumbent on all members of this Parliament to take our responsibilities seriously, to properly scrutinise the legislation at its further stages, and to ensure that it is fit for purpose and protects the rights of all. Scottish Labour believes that reforms must demedicalise the process and that the process for application uh, for a GRC set out in the current Act should be replaced with something that is more accessible and dignified, administrative in nature, and is not overly complex. Presiding officer, the bill uh, details who can apply for a gender recognition certificate and who the application will be made to, but it does not specify the form the application will take. And I do think that clarity on this is extremely important in order to provide confidence to all. And as we've already heard from my colleague Pam Duncan Glancy, we will seek to work with the government uh, in that space. If I may turn to the Equality Act, which um, has already been referenced uh, in a number of contributions today, the Equality Act is one of Labour's proudest achievements in government. It protects both women and trans people from discrimination, along with, as Pam Duncan Glancy outlined, disabled people, gay people, uh, and a variety of um, other protected characteristics. But that is why, as the Bill proceeds, Scottish Labour will take action to ensure that it is clear in the legislation that, for the avoidance of doubt, the protections in the Equality Act remain in place. We will scrutinise the Bill with an intensity as it continues to make its progress through Parliament. And it is important that this Bill is robust and commands confidence, not only in this chamber, but out with this chamber in the wider public. Presiding officer, we must not lose sight of what the purpose of the bill is. This is about giving trans people the right to live their life with dignity and respect. In coming to a close, from a broad perspective, the, the general principles of the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, as outlined, I believe will improve the lives of trans people in Scotland, ensuring that they do not have to go through the current process to achieve a gender recognition certificate, a process that is, as we have heard already, lengthy, traumatic and undignified. But along with colleagues, I respect the need to continue to work hard to scrutinise this legislation, to try to build that bridge so that everyone can have confidence that we deliver legislation that will be uh, respected. I hope that is a shared objective that we can all work together to achieve as the Bill progresses. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr O'Kane. I now call John Mason to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Mason. Hey, thank you very much, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak in today's debate. Hey, I guess I'm here to represent something of a minority view within the SNP who are not entirely happy with this bill. Hey, yes, it is government policy. However, as I suspect in other parties too, there are a range of views within our party on this topic. And can I particularly uh, mark my respect and admiration for Ash Reagan, uh, who has resigned over this today. I should probably say that within the SNP, who, those who are considering voting against the bill at stage one are doing so for slightly different reasons from each other. So I'm not speaking for or on behalf of anyone in particular, but I will try and cover some of the main concerns. I, th I think I won't, if you don't mind. I, th I think I've got a slightly niche area to deal with. I'll, I'll, I'll see where we get to later on. When I started thinking more about this issue some time ago, a couple of key words that came to me at that point were truth and love. From a Christian faith perspective, one of our key beliefs is that we should love, accept and care for every single individual person, and many others with no faith angle would completely agree with that. Every person on this planet is of equal worth and deserves to be valued, and that includes people we strongly disagree with or who are different from us in a variety of ways. So, as others have said, the tone of the debate today and beyond is important, and so far I think it has been quite good. We may disagree as to the best way forward on gender recognition, but I hope we can all respect each other for genuinely held beliefs as to what is best for all of our society and for the people who have questions about their gender. So, my first theme was love and care for each person, but my second word is truth. We all might and probably do want the world to be different from what it is. We want less poverty, fewer wars, and so on. Most of us are in politics to try and change these things. But certain things we need to accept as scientific or medical facts. The Earth goes round the sun once a year, days are shorter in winter. These are facts, whether we like them or not, and we have to accept them. 
And as I understand it to be a fact, there are two sexes, male and female. Each person is born on a certain day, in a certain place, and with a certain mother, all of which is recorded on a birth certificate. And a person's biological sex is discovered on that day, or possibly earlier if we're using scans, that that biological sex cannot be changed. And it is important, especially for healthcare rights going forward in life. When it comes to gender, there's much less agreement as to what that actually means. Some would say it's the same as sex, and that probably used to be the case in the past. But words can and do change their meanings over time, and I, for one, would personally see gender as a much more fluid concept, with different people understanding it in different ways. I personally am relaxed about that. So by all means, people can dress as they want, have relationships with whom they want, call themselves whatever gender they want. But let us not let that undermine the fact, pleasant or unpleasant, that their sex was discovered at birth and cannot change. Moving on then to another angle in this debate, and that is the impact on women. For hundreds of years in this country and around the world, women have been treated as second-class citizens in the home, at work, especially when it comes to pay, in the political field, and sadly when it comes to physical and other forms of abuse in the home and beyond. I'm glad to say that we have made some progress in this regard, although not nearly as much as we should have. And frankly, in some other countries, including Iran, the position and treatment of women is frankly appalling. Now, it has been argued that this bill does not change the position of women or impact their rights in any way. However, what it certainly does do is increasingly blur the distinction between men and women. If it becomes less clear as to who is a man and who is a woman, then almost inevitably it becomes more difficult to ensure that women are paid equally, are equally represented in Parliament or elsewhere, and it becomes more difficult to ensure that women have access to safe spaces, including prisons, where they can be reasonably certain that no men will be present. Because let's make no mistake about it, as has been said already, it is men, people whose biological sex at birth was male, who are consistently a threat to women, be that physically, mentally or emotionally. Just to choose one statistic I picked up, in domestic abuse cases, 92% of those being prosecuted were male. So clearly it is important to know who is male and who is female. Therefore, although in the face of it this bill might be considered to only deal with some technical issues, pertaining to gender recognition certificates and the like, it does also send out a wider message. Of course, this is true of much legislation. We pass an actual law, but we are also sending out a wider message. For example, we ban smoking in public places, but we were also sending out the message that smoking is harmful to health and should be reduced. We put a minimum price in alcohol, partly to send out the message that the country drinks too much and we should all cut down. And we passed the hate crime legislation to send out the message that our attitudes towards each other need to improve and we all need to become more tolerant and accepting. So in the same way, I fear that this legislation if passed would send out the message that the distinctions between male and female are not really relevant and that in turn would undermine our efforts to ensure that women have their rightful place in our society. Finally, I would just note that the trans community is not totally united on this. I have met a range of people over time, and a number do support a broad continuation of the present system. They would argue that gender dysphoria is a recognised condition and that it can and should be independently assessed. So for all of these reasons, I'm very much afraid that I cannot support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Tess White. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the history of this Parliament, today will be remembered for the first time after far, far too long, we have the opportunity to do something, something on one level rather ordinary, and yet something immensely precious. Today, we assert the simple right of all trans people with dignity and respect, without unnecessary intrusion, expense, medicalization or stigma, to ensure that their documents of identity accurately record that very identity. So, if they choose to marry the person they love, they can stand beside them as who they really are. And at the end of their lives, they know that that life, that that death, will be recorded as their own, not those of a non-existent stranger. Something ordinary, something simply human, but brought about by some extraordinary human endeavours. 
We owe a great debt today to our trans and non-binary friends, colleagues, comrades and relatives, those who have campaigned and explained, written, sung, painted, marched, prayed and believed. Today is for you. We see you and we thank you. But it is also for those trans people we've never met, never heard of or never heard from, those who have never been able to write to their MSP, respond to a consultation, maybe never told anyone that they are trans, maybe scarcely even told themselves. Wherever, we are, wherever you are today, today is for you. We acknowledge you and we keep a place for you. Today is for our children and young people, those with supportive families who struggle alongside them and those whose relatives have turned away. We look to the future, to a time when being trans or being cis is simply a facet of being human, like being gay or straight, left or right-handed. Today is for you. We welcome you and we stand with you. And today is for our trans friends and neighbours, those known to us and those unknown to anyone who are no longer with us, who chose not to live in a world that couldn't or wouldn't see them for who they were. We grieve for you and we hold you in our thoughts. We don't forget those elsewhere in the UK who have had their promises of reform cruelly trampled by a toxic government that would rather play at culture wars than keep its word. Today may not be for you, but tomorrow I hope will be. This bill has been assailed by a tsunami of disinformation, a heartbreaking moral panic manufactured and disseminated by a small number of people who should know better. I believe that many will come to know better, will bitterly regret the part they have played in this process. I implore them to show courage, not the empty bravado that dresses in appropriated colours, delighting in the discourse of disrespect, but the real courage that looks with meticulous attention on our history, sees the patterns of oppression recreated, recognises shared experience and is not afraid of difference. Today is not for you, but it could be. There is still time to join us. We are not yet where we want to be. This bill itself does not do everything we want it to do. Some of those gaps can potentially be filled in the stages ahead of us. I make no secret and no apology for calling for both three-month waiting and reflection periods to be taken out of the bill, for a reconsideration of the problematic person with an, person with an interest provisions, for the removal of the redundant and stigmatising new criminal offence, and for proper end-of-life provisions to be secured. Some of the gaps will take longer to fill. We need new laws, new processes, but and I say this particularly to those in the gallery or listening online who I know are directly affected by this. I am determined that appropriate gender recognition for under 16s and for non-binary people will be part of our shared future. You are not forgotten. And gender recognition is, of course, not the only imperative. We must and we shall with urgency and resolve ensure that trans health care is available to all who need it, when and where they need it. And we must and we shall, co shall comprehensively ban the despicable practices of so-called conversion. No. Before I close, presiding officer, I would just like to put on record my heartfelt thanks to my fellow com committee members for their thoughtful work over the last few months. I thank Joe Fitzpatrick, the clerks and SPICE researchers for guiding us through the stage one process with consideration and care. And most importantly, I want to thank all of those who gave evidence to us in person or in writing, even those with whom I profoundly disagree. But I do especially want to mention the trans people and their families who spoke and wrote so movingly. Thank you for making yourselves vulnerable, for sharing your experiences, your lives with us. Presiding officer, in closing, this bill does something simple. It makes it easier than the current process for trans people to be legally recognised as who they are. 
In the words of Ellie Gomezal, a young trans woman who spoke to the committee and said at the rally held outside Parliament this afternoon, sometimes it feels like the hardest thing about being trans is the admin. This bill changes that, and only that. As others have said, this bill has been a very long time coming, and we know there is still a long way to go. But today, together, we set our path in the right direction, and we do so in solidarity, with gratitude, and with love. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I now call Tess White to be followed by Michael Mara. Up to six, minute, please. six minutes, please, Ms White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Women are watching today. I hope the SNP is listening. At the heart of this matter is how we make trans people safe without affecting the safety of women and girls. That's the policy question that we, as elected politicians, must answer. It's fair and it's a balanced framing of the issue. But simply for asking that question, women, including the likes of JK Rowling, are being vilified. Their treatment throughout this process has been disgraceful. How are policymakers and members of the public supposed to scrutinise this legislation or any legislation when they risk being maligned for doing so? It is our role and it is our duty to examine the consequences, unintended or otherwise, of the laws we make. As we reflect on the general principles of the Bill, we must reflect too on the political and public discourse that has surrounded it, and we must learn from it. Presiding Officer, the SNP have been attempting to reform the Gender Recognition Act for half a decade. Despite taking additional time to review its approach, there has been little material change between the plans that were first consulted on by the Scottish Government in 2017 and the bill we are debating today. Following a second consultation and a delay due to COVID, the SNP Green Government bulldozed ahead, ignoring the SNP's own manifesto commitment to work with women on the reforms until pressure from critical media coverage forced their hand. Meetings were hastily arranged with women's interest groups, but the bill had already been finalised. It was a tokenistic gesture. The Equalities and Human Rights Commission urged caution in January this year, calling for a more detailed consideration given the potential consequences of reform for data use, competitive sport, barriers facing women, and the, crim and the criminal justice system. Meanwhile, Nicola Sturgeon dismissed women's views about the bill as not valid, a far cry from the maximum consensus the Scottish Government originally said it was seeking. There are fundamental issues with the bill's approach, including lowering the minimum age of application to 16, removing the need for medical evidence, and reducing the period that applicants must live in their acquired gender. There are, of course, serious implications for the safety of women in single-sex spaces. The bill is also scant on detail. The Scottish Government is still unable to tell us precisely what it means to live in the acquired gender for three months. We still don't know how it is possible to prove a false declaration without the individual confessing to it, making the provision a redundant deterrent for misuse. And what of the cross-border implications of the bill? The Equality and Human Rights Commission has warned that it may be difficult for trans people with Scottish GRCs to be certain of their legal status in England and Wales. The law is supposed to provide clarity, not question marks. Presiding officer, I've worked at a senior level in HR for more than 30 years. Inclusion and diversity are deeply ingrained in my personal and professional outlook. So too is safety. The Scottish Government has done nothing, nothing to convince me or many others that this legislation will not negatively impact the safety of women and girls, but also the safety of young people questioning their gender identity. A mother wrote to me this week, 
imploring me to consider the implications of this bill for young, young people, drawing on the incredibly difficult experience of her own daughter. She described the legislation as a sticking plaster and highlighted the need for a profoundly improved, supportive mental health care for children and adolescents exploring their gender identity. Removing a diagnosis of gender dysphoria does not diminish the distress that a 16-year-old can experience in this situation, but it does risk removing the safeguards and clinical support available to them should this bill pass. I deeply regret that the Scottish Government will not wait for the full publication of the CAS review before proceeding with the parliamentary passage of this legislation, especially with the closure of the Tavistock Centre in London next spring. The intent behind the Gender Recognition Reform Bill may be good, but the unintended harm could be greater. For that reason, together with the implications for the rights and safety of women and girls, I will vote against this bill at decision time. And it's shameful that MSPs from other parties, apart from Ash Reagan, who showed tremendous courage, who share my concerns, cannot do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. I now call Michael Mara to be followed by Emma Roddick. Up to six minutes, please, Mr. Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Transgender people are not new. As long as there have been people, there have been those who do not subscribe, those who do not fit, those who do not feel, those who simply are not the binary distinction of normative gender that many cultures have mapped far too closely onto the indisputable scientific genetic distinction of sex. Transgenderism can be seen in the relics of antiquity, in Sumeria, in Greece, in Rome. Transgenderism has been prevalent in, prevalent in the villages of rural Siberia, where environmental factors skewed the balance of the sexes. Trans visibility was noted in the high liberalism of Weimar Republic and increasingly across much of the West. And thankfully, today in this country, uh, which affords rights and freedoms to all. So transgender people, transgenderism is not new. What is new, uh, not at the moment, I'll make some progress if I can. What is new is the much wider availability of novel therapies and transition surgeries uh, alongside limitless social media information. And with these come possibilities for better lives for those who have suffered in silence or in anguish. And they also bring significant risks, especially when the pace of laws outstrip societal understanding. Hegel, in his Phenomenology of the Mind, argued that the identity of the self is entirely dependent on its recognition by others. Public recognition and personal identity are intertwined for every single one of us. And seeking legal recognition is no mere validation of personal uh, affirmation. It is a core function of the modern state and an expression of liberty. Yet biological sex remains the definitive organising fact of our state and our society. From cradle to grave, whether your child has two X chromosomes or a single X and Y chromosome will define their health, their physical development, their strength, their speed. Then society and culture wraps those things in a bundle of patriarchy and misogyny. I will in a second. In a bundle of patriarchy and misogyny, and sex matters even more. Yes. Karen Adam. On that point, there not. I thank the member for taking my intervention. Um, in terms of chromosomes, we have intersex people that exist. How does that match up with what you're saying? Michael Mara? I think, I think it, it matches entirely with what I say. People are, people are, there are people who are intersex who can have um, uh, organs, um, sexual organs from one, uh, or a mix of between the two. But the, the core being of the, the genetic side of this is about two X's or an X and Y. That is the basis of the biology. That is the basis of the biology. No, I won't. Not on that point. I think we, we could we can talk, maybe discuss that at a later point. Um, then society and culture, as I say, wraps those things in a bundle of patriarchy and misogyny, and sex matters even more. Status, standing, wages. Whether you can walk home at night, whether you might wake the following morning, whether you're raped, whether you require medical treatment in a system of education that trains doctors to understand your body as an aberration rather than as the majority. Women's sex-based rights are often self-policed by recognition on sight, usually through avoidance and removing themselves from danger. 
Then there are more intimate settings where women are even more vulnerable in hospitals and prisons receiving intimate care. When mental capacity has been diminished by age or disease, women who have been the victims of violence from men and who are at risk of violence from men require the sex-based protections afforded by the Equality Act. This is almost never the case because of other women or because of trans people, but overwhelmingly, as other members have said, because of the behaviours, attitudes and violence of men that runs through our culture. And this debate is set against the context of a rising tide of misogynistic violence. The many, many representations I have received from women ahead of this debate detail well-founded concerns that have not been answered by this Government to date on their protections as guaranteed in the Equality Act. That Act, those protections, that promise of security, progress and safety legislated for by a Labour Government must be guaranteed on the face of the Bill. Labour will seek to amend the legislation to that end. So it is right today that we vote for progressive reform for trans recognition and for the chance to amend this legislation. Confidence in the new process for obtaining a gender recognition certificate is paramount. Trans people should know that the process commands their own confidence and that of the wider public. And the bill, as drafted, has very few safeguards to prevent it being abused by bad actors. Scottish Labour believes that consideration should be given to how the application process can be strengthened in order to command the broadest possible public confidence. I personally believe that a counter-signatory process would help to build this confidence, meaning that applications are not made in solitary isolation. The comparable process would be changes to passports, to which all citizens must adhere when amending their personal details. The signature of another person, that recognition, is widely accepted and supported in this process and is a standard part of our day-to-day -day life. Such a signatory process, properly developed and implemented, could serve to better protect all parties. Recognition is, in the end, about how we relate to each other, how we are seen in our community. The Bill currently proposes the reduction of the age restriction for uh, gender recognition certificate applications from 18 to 16 years. And I think the Government has made a very poor job to date of answering critical questions posed in this area, including those from the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. And I believe that the significant development of the case for this change in the face of the risks would be necessary before it can command the necessary widespread public and political support. I believe that it is the job of Parliament to find common ground in the country, to balance the need for reform and the need for protection of existing, of existing rights. The struggle for recognition is a practice of freedom. So say Wittgenstein, Foucault, Arendt. That struggle is just, yet the balance of rights and common protections can easily be tipped. Unamended, this legislation will fail the test set by the First Minister herself that the rights of trans people and women can both be secured. The Government and this Cabinet Secretary have a very long way to go in the coming weeks before this legislation can meet that test. Thank you, Mr Mara. And I now call Emma Roddick, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I just want to first say that, that trans rights are human rights. And as a woman, I don't feel that they are in conflict with my own. I'm speaking today... I am speaking today to defend the rights of others in the LGBTQI community to be who they are. Access to documentation which reflects your gender is necessary for privacy, for expression and for just living as what you are. It's paradoxical to me, really, that you have to live in your acquired gender for a period before accessing documentation that allows you to, to live in your acquired gender, but I suppose Listening to other contributions today, it might need to be the next reform of the Gender Recognition Act that remedies that. There should be nothing controversial about what we are actually discussing today. We are simplifying a process which trans people have told us in great numbers and over a long period of time is humiliating and intrusive. We are removing a medical aspect from an administrative process that has no reason to be there. Being trans is not an illness and our law needs to reflect that. I have a members business debate pending at the moment on mental health stigma and many of the points that I intend to raise then are relevant today and to trans people. The demedicalisation of the process to have trans ident identities recognised is the right thing to do and it's overdue in a moment. The WHO and the current edition of the ICD have already done away with this. 
that the permission of doctors and panels is still required is an anachronism, and it simply does not make sense for it to remain. I will take an intervention. Sue Webber. For taking the intervention. Does the member agree with the Scottish Government's own equality impact assessment on this bill that it says we need more up-to-date research on how this will affect mental health and well-being of our young people? Emma Roddick. I, I think that we need to do a lot of work on, on supporting particularly young trans people, um, but trans people overall with their mental health. And I'm sure that we will discuss that in detail when we discuss health care for, for trans people in future. Um, the Council of Europe report published in July outlined the need for steps to depathologise legal gender recognition. And I agree with Karen Adam that we will be behind the times if we don't pass this bill. And actually, I think we're probably already behind the times. This will let us catch up a little. And nothing in front of us today is a new idea. We are slowly, very slowly, catching up with international best practice. In fact, whatever some would have you believe, it's not even new to this country. I remember sitting on my lunch break as a teenager with my phone out watching Shirley Ann Somerville give a statement on forthcoming gender recognition reforms, reforms which every party in this place today backed in their 2016 manifestos. Trans people have been promised these improvements for a long time and there is no justification for allowing it to drag on any longer. I agree with various members of the opposition who have said that this debate should be respectful, but I can't agree that it should remain respectful because it hasn't been. We cannot kid ourselves otherwise. In the course of this afternoon alone, I've heard certain members misgender repeatedly trans people that they're talking about. I've heard outright denial of the legitimacy of transgender identities. There's nothing respectful about transphobia, and those things I have just described are transphobia. I refuse to submit to claims that these statements are respectful just because they're said in a polite and even tone. They are never respectful, they are hateful, and I'll never be comfortable with them being spoken in a place like this. I would like to make one personal reflection too as a survivor. I'm still years into this debate horrified by the way that some people use my experience to justify transphobia. I am traumatised but I don't blame trans people or believe that their right to privacy is any less or more important than my own. My trauma is the fault of a cisgender man and he did not have to make a statutory declaration to legally change his gender in order to cause the harm that he did. Women have so many fights left to win on the route to equality. Fighting other women just because their experience looks different to your own gets you nowhere. And I do regret that today, at least, we're not discussing legislation that will allow legal recognition for non-binary identities. I want to give special mention to my MB friends, and I want to assure them that they're not forgotten. I recognise the position that they are in. I hope it is not too long before we see justice for them. As a queer woman and as a current co-convener of the LGBTI CPG, I will always stand by my non-binary neighbours and I will keep on raising their lack of recognition until they gain it. I had an email only yesterday from a trans constituent, which I'd like to end on. They were grateful that they didn't have to worry about what I might respond with as one of their representatives. And I'd like to share with you a small bit of the email because to me, it, it sums up what we're here to do today. And I think it's probably far more meaningful than anything I can come up with as a cisgender woman. They said, this is not the first time pleading my humanity to strangers. During the course of my transition, I've had to subject numerous intimate details of my life for scrutiny and judgment. It is always stressful and humiliating. For me, that's what these proposed changes to the process are about. It fills me with hope to think of all the collective time, money and pain that this bill could spare. Now, I hope we do the right thing by my constituent today and in the further stages of this bill and that we keep in mind the trans people, the people this bill actually affects who are watching at home, scrolling on Twitter for news or sitting in the gallery above us. They have been waiting far too long for what many consider to still be far too little. Let's keep our promises to them. Thank you, Ms Roddick. We will now move to the closing statements and I call on Jackie Bailey to uh, wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the benefit of being in Parliament for a long time is that you have a relatively long institutional memory. Um, you've worked your way through literally hundreds of pieces of legislation, sat through lengthy stage twos, explored what you can do with amendments, reasoned or otherwise, and you become skilled at negotiation, both 
as a minister, I can remember that long ago, or indeed with ministers of the current government. And yes, you do even learn to compromise, because our aim must be to have the very best legislation we can. But with no second revising chamber and legislation often progressing at breakneck speed, there is a particular responsibility on us in this parliament to get it right. That therefore means it is right to challenge, it is right to debate the issues, no matter how difficult that might be. The Gender Recognition Reform Bill is both simple and complex in terms of legislation, and it is in the nature of these things that there will undoubtedly be challenges in the courts. The greater the complexity, the greater the level of concern, the greater the requirement for us as legislators to consider the provisions and their effect carefully and whether there are unintended consequences. Government has a responsibility to lead, but they also have a responsibility to take the country with them. But legislation is just one part of what government should do. How they spend money, how they set policy is equally important. So let me turn to this specific debate and say very clearly at the outset, I support the general principles of the bill. But I have to say, as others have done, the name-calling and insults that have characterised much of the discourse has been unwarranted and unhelpful. So too the blanket assertions, without much supporting evidence, that simply do nothing to promote understanding. Or indeed the questions that are often asked of government, but sometimes not fully answered. They do nothing to reassure people with doubts. And complex and difficult issues demand of us a thorough and mature approach. Concerns have been expressed from a variety of different perspectives. We've heard them today. Some people are vehemently opposed to the bill, and whilst I might disagree with them, I will always listen to their point of view respectfully. Others are hugely supportive and point to their own experience or that of their children of gender dysphoria and the lack of access to services, to support, and actually the lack of recognition of who they are. And of course, there are those who are broadly supportive, but are worried that there may well be unintended consequences. So I want to address some of those concerns, as this will be the area of focus indeed. Jackson Carlow. I very much hope to support this bill at stage three. Uh, and, and intend to abstain tonight. Uh, I've heard compelling speeches from, I think, the one she's developing, from Michael Mara, from Pam Duncan Glancy, and from Jamie Green. And I wonder if she would welcome an assurance from the Cabinet Secretary that they will be open to constructive amendment of this bill. Because, frankly, the record of the government on being open to amendments is not a strong one. Fulton McGregor has said the committee will be. Would she welcome that assurance? Uh, Jackie Bailey. I welcome the uh, brief intervention from the member. And I do welcome what I think has been signalled by the Cabinet Secretary, but I'm sure she will take the opportunity to do so in her closing speech that the government is open to that dialogue. I really, really hope that that is the case. And let me address some of the issues that I would like to see. And let me start with the Equality Act. The point was raised by a number of members. And as I understand it, the point is that the Scottish government will apparently argue in court in relation to the Public Boards Act that a GRC changes someone's sex under the Equality Act of 2010. If that's the case, the argument that is made is that the practical impact of that is things like single sex provision will effectively not exist. Now, I understand that people want clarity on that point, and I think it would be helpful, if not today, that the Minister does address this. Women have specifically expressed concerns about the need to protect women-only services and spaces. I think we recognise that women's rights have been hard fought for and hard won. And as Pam Duncan Glancy made the point, um, all rights have been hard fought for and hard won. But Scottish Labour do understand the strength of feeling on this issue and their desire to ensure that women's rights are protected. We will therefore seek to amend the bill at stage two to respect the primacy of the Equality Act and have this placed on the face of the bill. We also, uh, turning to gender recognition certificates, absolutely understand that the point is to simplify and demedicalise the process, and I agree with this. But the government has described who can apply for a GRC, who they make their application to, but there is no description of how, and we will seek to clarify that at stage two as well. Let me turn to age, and many people have expressed concerns to all of us about whether 16 is the appropriate age. Um, and these are difficult issues, and I don't necessarily know the answer to that. But I am encouraged 
by the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to engage with Christine Graham, who raised the point first, and indeed with others in the Chamber about this. Presiding officer, I want to touch briefly on the CAS review into gender identity services for young people in England. It is an interim report, but its findings should inform how we deliver treatment and services in Scotland and at the Sandyford Clinic. And I know and welcome the fact that Health Improvement Scotland have been tasked with developing national standards of care for Sandyford's Young Gender Clinic, it, but it won't be published until the end of 2023. Now, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will agree that our young people deserve the best possible medica medical care that is based on clinical research and best practice, and we should urge the Government to accelerate this process. Presiding officer, can I single out speeches in closing from across the Chamber? Jamie Green, Karen Adams, Paul O'Kane, far too many people to name. They were powerful, they were personal contributions, and they challenge us to think. I believe reform is required, and I will support the general principles of this bill, but there is room for improvement. Let me say that Labour has a proud tradition of promoting equality and human rights. We introduced the 1998 Human Rights Act, the 2010 Equality Act, and I am proud that it was Labour that repealed Section 28 in this Scottish Parliament. We will support this bill at Stage 1, but the Government must understand that they need to address the concerns outlined today if they wish to continue the command and to continue to command support right the way across this chamber. Thank you, Ms Bailey. I now call on Pam Gozel to uh, wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Gozel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am honoured to be closing this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. I would like to begin by joining my colleagues across the chamber in thanking everyone from our witnesses to the clerks, the organisations and constituents who took the time to write to me, all of which I have taken into consideration. As we have heard today, there are strong views on both sides of this debate across the Chamber. And with this in mind, due to the limited time and the significance of this debate, I will not be using the traditional route of closing by summarising members' contributions. And I will also emphasise that I will not be taking any interventions. While I do not doubt the good intentions of those voting in favour of this bill, the proposed law is a letdown for women and girls, faith communities and for children who require the protection of the law. The, <laughs> I said I was not taking intervention. The proposed bill is ill-thought, ill-considered and most of all unpredictable. It seeks to remove any medical oversight and opens the process to a group of unknown size and characteristics. And maybe there is no perfect answer that would solve all the issues. But don't we owe it to everyone, whether they are trans or not, religious or not, female or not, a child or not, to spend longer seeking a fair way forward. The vexed nature of this topic has seen those standing in opposition to bad legislation labelled transphobes. However, as a member of the Equalities Committee, I can say with confidence that I have given this bill due consideration. The removal of the requirement for a medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria, the reduction in the time lived in the acquired gender, the lowering of the minimum age from 18 to 16, and the removal of the gender recognition panel strips the process of all current safeguards. Leaving in their wake a flimsy criminal offence for a false statutory declaration which is near impossible to improve. Among the tsunami of emails that I have received from my constituents, there were several who had lived experience of struggling with a gender identity. They urged me to vote against the bill today because they believe without the current safeguards they would have embarked on a life-altering process as children. The lowering of the minimum age is irresponsible 
especially when accompanied by the removal of medical oversight, which the Scottish Council on Human Bioethics have urged against. This is just one of the provisions that must be addressed should this bill go ahead to stage two. The, the SNP Government are ignoring the significance of this bill on the Equality Act 2010, meanwhile arguing its significance in the court. They have repeatedly dismissed the wider implications of this bill on women of faith, women and girls, and more broadly, which is something extremely close to my heart. I am deeply concerned that this law has not been drafted with them in mind. For example, for women of faith, when it comes to medical situations such as visiting a GP, where treatment by the opposite sex may be a breach of religious practices, or the sacrity of single-sex spaces for a woman performing the partial washing in a public bathroom before their prayer. They are already a marginalised group in our society. And this legislation would prompt them to self-exclude even further from public life. The committee has received evidence from Heal Survivors Group and women who have felt compelled to self-exclude from services offered under Rape Crisis Scotland because of its refusal to guarantee a women-only environment. I also have other constituents worried about whether an elderly woman can be guaranteed a female carer to help with washing and dressing, which is justified fear since NHS Lothian said that it was unable to guarantee female-only care due to the privacy protections in Section 22. Presiding officer, organisations that gave evidence to the committee such e-gender, Stonewall, an equality network, and even the Cabinet Secretary herself all argue as though the issues is whether a GRC is necessary or gives a right to gain access to single-sex services or spaces. But the real concern here is that the change of sex under the Equality Act 2010 makes it easier for a growing number of GRC holders to exchange exclusions for, them, for these places, spaces. So can you understand why there are valid concerns the services providers are less likely to challenge anyone with a GRC who asserts a right to be in a female-only space? In conclusion, presiding officer, this bill departs significantly from the Gender Recognition 2004 Act. The Scottish Government has lost sight of the bill's original intention and produced what I consider to be a piece of legislation that begs for unintended consequences and legal challenge. In light of the evidence presented here today, the evidence I have heard in committee and the concerns of my constituents I will be voting against the bill at stage one, and I urge members across this chamber to do the same. Thank you, Ms Goza. I now call on Shona Robinson, Cabinet Secretary, to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I first of all say that I think we have, by and large, continued with what is a respectful uh, debate uh, this afternoon. We have had a, a range of views um, across uh, the, the Chamber um, in relation to the Bill. I want to also put on record again my thanks to the committee, um, the convener and of course the clerks who have done a huge amount of work in getting the, the Bill uh, to this stage. Um, I want to refer as, to as many people's contributions as I can, uh, but if I'm not able to cover them all, I will try and follow up in writing because some important uh, points have been made that I want to try and cover. I want to first of all turn to um, Pam Duncan Glancy and at some of the points made by Jackie uh, Bailey. Let me be very clear, I have felt that I've had an open door policy up to now and have met Pam Duncan Glancy on a number of occasions uh, and have been trying to build 
consensus where I can. So let me give a categorical assurance that as we move to stage two, I will absolutely work with members across this chamber on constructive amendments. I'll give them all a fair hearing and seek to build consensus where possible. I would ask that they are uh, constructive, that they are in line with the principles of the Bill and, of course, need to be legal and competent. But uh, I think we can get there. And I want to reference two uh, areas in particular. So the Equality Act 2010. Now, I have said since the beginning of this process that this Bill uh, makes no impact on the Equality Act 2010. It can't because, obviously, the Equality Act uh, is a reserved matter. But perception is also important, and I recognise the concerns about that. And as I've said as well, that the single-sex exemptions under the Equality Act will remain uh, regardless of this bill. However, um, putting, putting this on the face of the bill, um, I understand uh, will help to leave that in no doubt whatsoever. And I recognise the importance of that. So I'm very willing to work with Pam Duncan Glancy and others to uh, achieve that. I'm happy to take uh, Pauline's intervention. Pauline McNeill. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for what she said, which she is constructive in the sense that Scottish Labour is asking for that in the face of the Bill. So I have to say I'm, I'm pleased about that. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would also agree that it's important to get clarity in the Government's position and clarity in the law. And some people have asked why the Scottish Government will argue in court that a GRC changes someone's sex under the Equality Act for the purposes of arguing on the Public Appointments Board. And that just does seem to be at odds with what the Cabinet Secretary has said to Parliament. If you could see there seems to be a contradiction. I think it would be very helpful, Cabinet Secretary, if you could clear that up. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. So I'm not going to comment on a live court case as you wouldn't expect me to, but we accept, the Scottish Government accepts and agrees completely with the Equality Human Rights Commission, their definition of the protected characteristics under the Equality Act 2010 and the effect of a GRC. None of that has changed since the 2004 Act and none of it will change with this bill. It remains exactly the same. So I can give that, that guarantee again. The other area that I wanted to um, mention is about the, the process um, of, of application. And again, a point uh, raised by uh, Labour members. And again, I am happy to work with them and, and indeed others across the chamber um, to look at how we can uh, perhaps address some of the concerns. I thought Michael Mara made some uh, quite um, useful uh, suggestions around what that might look like. So um, I am happy again to work uh, across the chamber to, to look at how we can do that. I also wanted to uh, come back to an issue raised uh, about uh, access to um, health care support. And as I said in response to the committee's report, the, the Scottish Government absolutely recognises the need to provide the, the best possible care for young people who are questioning their gender identity or experiencing um, gender dysphoria. And we and NHS Scotland will, of course, closely monitor the ongoing findings of the CAS review within the context of NHS Scotland services as they become available alongside wider nat national and international uh, evidence. Um, but we have to be clear that clinical decision making and clinical services are very different and have no relation to this bill. This bill is about changing the process by which someone can obtain a gender recognition certificate. You do, don't require a gender recognition certificate to access clinical services. But we absolutely accept the point about those clinical services needing to improve. And I think the Cabinet Secretary for Health has already made a commitment to, uh, to work with the, the committee um, around those improvements that are already in the pipeline to, to be made to ensure that waiting times are reduced. Yes. Rachel Hamilton. Um, the, within the response from the Scottish Government to the committee, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary of Health did not commit at the moment to the ask of the committee, which is the review of the, the 
gender dysphoria services for children and young people um, and all people. At the moment, obviously, there's a very long waiting time. I, I recognise that this isn't part of the bill, Cabinet Secretary, but it was an important part of the evidence that we took that this should be that the waiting time should be reduced and, in, and services should be improved. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. So, back in December 2021, the member will be aware that the framework for service improvement was uh, issued, which includes commissioning a, a national ser clinical service for young people. Um, so there's already work going on, and that will be informed by all the press, best practice clinical guidelines, robust evidence on treatments, and new models of delivery uh, as such information becomes available. And that will be inclusive of relevant developments uh, in England, the rest of the UK, and internationally. So I, I don't think there's any disagreement here. Um, and the, the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, is, of course, uh, taking that forward. I want to um, reference a few other uh, comments that have been made. I thought Alec Gold Hamilton um, made a good point about the difficult and lengthy process and why it puts so many people off. And that's borne out by the evidence because of the estimated half a million trans people in the UK, only around 6,000 currently have a GRC. Now that says to me that there is a huge problem with the process. And as I've said before, I think the people who will take advantage of the new simplified process for obtaining a GRC will be those who have already been living in the required gender, many for decades um, out of uh, all of those, those people. And that's the evidence from elsewhere internationally that those uh, who take advantage of the changed processes are people who have already been living uh, in that acquired gender. I thought Jamie Green uh, made a very uh, powerful contribution. Uh, he said um, that uh, we're not talking about a mental illness here. He talked about some of the uh, concerns and the same arguments being used as being used against other minorities over the, the decades. And he is absolutely right. And he talked about things that he doesn't know. Well, let me speak as a mum of a teenage daughter and how my fear for her when she goes out at the weekend of whether she's going to come home okay and I'll secretly wait up to make sure she comes in the door is because of my concern about predatory and abusive men, not trans people who are out on a Friday and Saturday night going about their business. So, yes, of course. Uh, for the benefit of those who perhaps, apologies, Officer, for the benefit of those who didn't sit in the debate, that's exactly the point I made verbatim, is that it's not predatory trans people with issue, it's predatory men. But what I am saying is that whilst I'm pleased to support the Minister and the Government uh, by lending my support in today's vote, it is not without compromise. It is very clear, even within her own benches and those in the wider public, that there is a bigger discourse still to be had. There are still people who do feel their voices have not been fully heard in this. I would like some commitment from the Cabinet Secretary that she will constructively engage, not use the parliamentary majority that the governing parties have, but constructively engage with every single member to ensure that what we do pass at Stage 3 is worthy of this Parliament. Can Cabinet I, Secretary, actually, and in conclusion. Yes, can I agree with Jamie Green? Uh, actually, that's what I want. I want to build maximum consensus, but of course that has to be around the principle of this bill that the current process uh, for transgender people is, is, is not as it should be because it puts people off being able to obtain a gender recognition certificate. And I think we've heard that across the chamber. So what I want to do is to build the consensus that we can in order to try and make this bill the best and have the best law that we possibly can. As Jackie Bailey said yesterday, um, and I will do that. I've had an open door policy and I'm happy to work with Jamie Green um, and Pam Duncan Glancy, Jackie Bailey and others to be able uh, to do that as far as we can. And that's a commitment that I'd like to give at the end of this debate. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill at Stage 1. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, and there's one question to be put as a result of today's business. 
And that question is that motion 6459 in the name of Shona Robertson on Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill at Stage 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will be moving to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.